Thank you, Alaska and Carla, for the um, opportunity to speak today on business and COVID-19. And I believe this may be the first time that I've addressed 26 Shannon. Uh, and it's also a pleasure to be back here in the Dáil Chamber. I'm not sure I've been here this year at all. We've been exiled to the um, Convention Centre, as you know, but I'm glad that uh, the Senators are making good use of this chamber uh, during our brief exile. Um, I also want to allow, I also want to offer belated congratulations to all of you on your election to this August House. And in particular, I want to congratulate Senator Maria Byrne on her return to the Shannon, uh, and also to Senator Jerry Horkin. It's now 14 months since the first case of COVID-19 was confirmed in Ireland. And since then, COVID-19 has dominated our lives and dominated the political agenda. More than 7,000 people in Ireland's north and south have lost their lives, and the public health measures designed to prevent further deaths have taken their toll on people's lives and livelihoods. The government certainly hasn't got everything right, but I think there is much to be proud of in Ireland's collective response to the pandemic, with one of the lowest mortality rates in Europe. Our much criticised health service has stood up to scrutiny, and our frontline and essential workers have excelled, and our businesses have adapted overnight. While we came too close for comfort, we never ran out of ICU beds, never came close to capacity in terms of ventilators or oxygen or general bed capacity. And unlike many other countries, we did not need to send patients abroad. We have a same-day testing service for COVID and a vaccine program that has vaccines administered to patients within days of their delivery to the state. And I think with the intensification of our vaccine program over the next couple of weeks, we can now be hopeful for the future. More than 200,000 people vaccinated in the last seven days, and we expect close to a quarter of a million to be vaccinated next week. Yesterday's announcement of the reopening of the economy provides a pathway out of this incredibly difficult period for us. But it cannot be a false dawn. We must avoid a fourth wave of hospitalizations and deaths this side of autumn winter 2021, if not entirely. People have sacrificed too much and waited too long. This time we want to see construction, retail, hospitality and tourism reopen and stay open. And so we'll continue to reopen the, con the economy based on four tests. Number one, stable or falling cases, that's a reproductive number, at or at our, our below one. Number two, the condition and capacity of our hospitals and ICUs. Number three, the vaccine program's progress. And number four, any concern about new variants. India's terrible second wave is a reminder that we must proceed with caution. It's also a reminder that this is a global fight against a highly infectious disease, and nobody is safe until everyone is safe. Ensuring that all the world is vaccinated is a mammoth task, and it's best done through multilateral action through COVAX, the World Health Organization, and the World Trade Organization. Where capacity exists, companies that have developed vaccines should license their products, especially in the global south. Unfortunately, little capacity does exist in reality, and so it will take time. On the one-year anniversary of COVAX, the vaccine sharing facility, we must be honest with ourselves that it is the rich, rich countries, including Ireland, that will be vaccinated first. And we must redouble our efforts to help less well-off countries catch up. And in the meantime, we must do everything we can to send help to India, and we are. I think the House will agree that the government's financial supports for both workers and businesses have not been found wanting. The three main schemes, the Employment Wage Subsidy Scheme, the Pandemic Unemployment Payment, and the COVID Restrictions Support Scheme compare favorably with any other packages on offer in other countries. But we also need to be honest about ourselves. This is borrowed money, money provided by banks and bondholders and the European Central Bank, institutions that some wanted to burn, default on, or repudiate only a decade ago. It was wise that we did not. Nonetheless, this debt will have to be serviced and will have to be refinanced, but not just yet. There is time to allow our economy to recover. We have complemented the three main schemes with sectoral schemes, such as the Tourism Business Continuity Scheme and the Small Business Assistance Scheme for COVID, and there will be a second round of funding from this shortly. We have also provided a range of other interventions, including commercial rates waivers, tax warehousing, restart grants, and low-cost loans. 
Around this time next month, we'll publish the National Economic Recovery Plan, and it will present our vision for what the post-recovery economy will look like and how we plan to support businesses and employees in the months ahead. I think it's going to be a rocky road, but I think we're much better placed to recover quickly than we were from the Great Recession a decade ago. That's partly because the government has been able to intervene and provide direct financial assistance to businesses and employees when they needed it most. We went into this pandemic with public finances in good order, our debt was falling, and we were able to borrow cheaply and easily when we needed to. If we stay on track, I believe we can recover all the jobs lost during the pandemic by 2023. As a government, we understand the importance of continued financial supports to business, and we will ensure that there's no cliff-edge scenario, especially for firms and workers in particularly affected sectors, such as aviation, tourism, hospitality, the arts and entertainment. Some businesses will bounce back quickly. Indeed, a number of businesses are already repaying the subsidies paid to them by government. But others will take longer to come back, if at all. We're also going to look at ways to make state-backed loans more attractive and easier to access within the state aid rules of the European Union. And we know that companies are going to require increased increase liquidity when they reopen over the coming weeks and months. And we need to make that assistance as cost-effective and as useful as possible. We'll complement this financial assistance with a new summary rescue process to provide small companies breathing space to restructure in a fast and inexpensive way. That's an alternative to the examinership process through the Circuit Court and High Court. This legislation is being prepared by Minister Troy and will be coming to the House before the summer recess. And with the support of members, I hope the bill will pass in good time. I've also asked my officials to work on guidance for employers to make greater use of antigen testing. Some companies are already using it, and we want to encourage companies to use it more in our workplaces as another tool to combat COVID-19. Following the reconfiguration of government departments, my department has been renamed the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Employment, and has taken on some of the employment rights policy remit from the Department of Social Protection. Members may be aware that I'm pursuing initiatives to improve workers' terms, conditions and pay in the coming years. I believe this makes economic sense and is also morally right. We must do so, however, in a way that is not counterproductive. If businesses are forced to shed jobs or reduce people's hours due to rising labour costs, nobody will gain from that scenario. The pandemic has highlighted that there is no legal obligation on employers to provide sick pay in Ireland. The government has introduced, has introduced enhanced illness benefit, but it's evident that a longer term, more sustainable scheme now needs to be put in place for all illnesses and not just COVID-19. We're currently finalising a general scheme of the statutory sick pay bill with colleagues in the Department of Social Protection. This will build on social protections we've put in place over the past five years, including the introduction of paternity benefit, parental leave benefit, the restoration of treatment benefit, and the extension of social insurance benefits to the self-employed and farmers, including uh, treatment benefit, job seekers benefit, and the invalidity, patient, uh, invalidity pension. We've also effectively abolished zero hours contracts and increased the minimum wage well ahead of inflation. Senators, the pandemic has prompted us to redefine our definition of a frontline or essential worker. I know when I was growing up, we thought of them as doctors, nurses, guardi, paramedics, generally people in uniform with good public sector jobs, pensions, and paid more than the average or median wage. But we now also think of retail workers, transport workers, cleaners, security guards, and food service staff, people who kept us going during this pandemic. So one of the legacies of the pandemic must be better terms and conditions for everyone, including a move to a living wage and access to an occupational pension for all workers to supplement the state pension. Earlier this month, following my request, the Low Pay Commission formally began work on examining how Ireland can move towards a living wage during this, the period of this government. The study is looking at international evidence on living wages, examining different calculation met methods, and should report in the second half of this year, allowing us to make meaningful progress on this project next year. Another dividend and legacy of the pandemic will be the remove to remote working. When the pandemic is over, many of us will return to the office and will be glad to do so. But things will never be the same again. 
through the implementation of our remote working strategy, I want to make sure that we seize the opportunity to make a permanent change in the way we work. A better work-life balance, less commuting, and more collaborative office environments. In addition to the recently signed Right to Disconnect Code of Practice, I'll be introducing legislation on the right to request remote work. It will provide a clear framework around which requesting, approving, or refusing remote work can be based. I'm under no illusions about how difficult the coming months will be for business. Some are barely hanging on and simply won't survive into 2022. Reopening won't be successful for everyone. I think last week's announcement by KBC and Carphone Warehouse were a stark reminder of the serious difficulties that we are facing in the months ahead. The change in how we shop and the change in how we bank wasn't caused by the pandemic, but it has accelerated it and it will be permanent. So when it comes to the twin transition, digital and green, there will be jobs lost as well as gained, and new businesses as well as business failures. For our part, the government will be doing everything possible to help the retail sector and banking sectors adapt and to help employees reskill for new jobs where old jobs are lost. I look forward to hearing Senator's contributions and responding to your questions. Thank you very much.